Hello and welcome to Do It Yourself Musician. On today's video, we're gonna be back on the power supply for my Tac Scorpion console here. In the last video, we tore it down, uh, looked at what parts we needed and ordered up those parts. All those parts are in now, so we're gonna go ahead and, and uh, complete the rebuild on the power supply for this thing. And where the video starts, I lost a couple of clips actually uh, for recapping the smaller caps on the PCB. Um, so I don't have those video clips, but we're just going to start after I've done that. So just know that when the video starts, I've already done that, but you've seen me recap things before and it's no big deal. So, all right, here we go. Okay, I wanted to go over the new semiconductors that I'm going to put in the unit. Uh, originally, I wasn't going to buy new semiconductors. I was just going to reuse the ones that were in there. Um, and the reason for that is, is these uh, LM338... Uh, K's, which I got one right here. These jobbers. Uh, when I look these up on uh, online, they uh, at legitimate dealers. Let's put it that way. Mauser, DigiKey. These things are about seventy. You know, anywhere between sixty to seventy bucks for one of these uh, LM three three eight K's. You can find them on eBay and other places down below a dollar. So uh, the cost of these ranges from a dollar to $70 and that disturbs me. You know, the, the cheap ones, uh, I think Jameco sells them for maybe 20 bucks or something. Uh, they're probably fine. There's, there's probably not anything wrong with them, but you have to wonder why at legitimate dealers, they cost so much money. And I just didn't want to put any cheap old, semiconductor in there you know i wanted it to be at least somewhat of a name brand but what happened was is when i was going to install this guy or just checking it out i realized well one of the pins is broken off this one in fact someone soldered pins on here or just some wire to try to replace these pins that were cut sometime in the past and uh and this uh restoration i need all the length i can get out of these so i can solder these to the pcb so that sent me down the road of trying to get new semiconductors which is fine but you know like i said i didn't want to put that much money into it which i guess you could argue that it's worth it if you're trying to make this thing reliable is to just go ahead and pay the money for those so what i wound up doing was going with all nte parts that i bought directly from nte's website uh, this way I know that these are legitimate parts. They're not pulls. They're not uh, some other just rebranded part or whatever. And plus, there's some type of warranty on them. And, and they're a, little, a bit cheaper than what you can find on Mauser and DigiKey's website. So let me just run down what we have here. On the left here is the 219. And that is replacing um, Q2 in the schematic. That's a, a Motorola part. It's MJ29. Five, five. You can see that right there, MJ2955. And that's replacing that. And that unit is a silicon PMP power transistor is what that is. So that's replacing that MJ2955. Then the next thing we have is the NTE970 here. That's replacing U3, which is the LM317. I'll show it to you in circuit here. That's uh, U3 right there. And that is a, a three terminal adjustable positive voltage regulator. And I think that thing can handle up to three or four amps or something. I'm not sure about that, but it it's just replaces the 317, which is a very common uh, voltage regulator. A lot of you guys may, may have used it before. It's just a 317 and a T03 package is what it is. These next two units we have here are uh, NTE 395s. I know that's hard to read, but I'm going to show it to you here somehow. Right, right there, NTE 395. And those are to replace U1 and U2, which we have U1 there. Uh, U2's there, and those are those LM338Ks. 
Um, and those things are uh, uh, also voltage regulators. They are, I think, uh, five amps capable, and they're uh, just adjustable voltage regulators. And these work on the um, plus and minus audio rails. This one works on the phantom power rail. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and get these guys installed. Now I'm going to get into talking about doing the modifications to this power supply. Uh, probably rather confusingly. There's not really an easy way to explain this, so I urge you in the description below, I'm going to put a link to the modification document for this put out by AML, which is Audio Maintenance Limited. It's a company in England that I believe bought up all the spares for AMEC and TAC supplies. They bought up all the parts and things when that company went out of business and you can buy parts and things from them to you know, refurbish your console or whatnot. So if, you're, if you have one of these consoles and you don't know about them, you should definitely look them up. It's Audio Maintenance Limited. But anyways, get that document and uh, download it and, and look at it so you'll know what I'm talking about here. This is a page out of that document right here. You can see 750 series modification. And basically what you're looking at is like a side on view of the uh, heat sink like this. It's kind of what they're trying to show here. So you have your semiconductor, your heat sink and your PCB. And in between it, this red piece here is a piece of plastic. So instead of having the socket in here, because we're taking those crappy sockets out and we're just gonna solder these pins directly to the bottom of this PCB, in order to isolate the heat sink from the PCB, they put a, a piece of plastic in there. Download that document and you'll see exactly how they did it, right? And uh, also it has the hardware assortment that you need. They use metric screws here. I use number six uh, US because I, it's hard to find uh, M4 and M3 stuff in the US. So I use number six anyways. So I varied from what they did a bit. Instead of cutting a piece of plastic to fit down here in this area where the heat sink goes down to isolate it from the PCB, what I did is I used nylon washers here, which you can see here. There's four here and four here. And the reason I did that was because I really didn't have any suitable plastic to use for this. I'm not sure what they used. The only plastic I really have around here is some ABS laminate plastic, but that has a really low melting point. So I decided to just use these nylon washers. And nylon, I think, its, it's melting point is, geez, I don't know. It's got to be four or 500 degrees. Uh, but these, like, like I said, these are just nylon. These are little nylon washers is all they are. And I went ahead and I just put tiny little dots of super glue underneath them to glue them down, which I think is fine. I don't think that's going to do anything to destroy this because remember, this is basically a permanent uh, modification to this. Uh, once we put this back together, it's going to be in its case for forever, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so instead of the plastic, I'm using these nylon washers. If you're looking... Uh, at the document. So you can see I've already put one of the heat sinks on here. Here's what the bottom looks like. You can see the, the hardware there. And just, just as in there, in the AML document, I put um, nylon, that's not actually supposed to be there. I put nylon uh, uh, washers underneath these nuts. Uh, this is kind of where it gets weird, is that the case of the TO3 package, because you know on a TO3 package, you've got two leads and the case. So just look at this for instance, we have two leads and then the case. Well the case needs to make contact to this trace. In the old unit, or the way it was done before we're modifying it, with these old sockets and see this little tab here, that tab went over and made contact with that trace, but we don't have this anymore. So we've got to get a way for the case to, to make contact with that trace. 
So what they did is they use a ring terminal to do that with, and you can see it right here because I've already I've already done it over here. I've done three of them now. Here's one here. They it doesn't look too great, <laughs> but I assure you it works fine. And uh, a ring terminal is just one of those um, ring terminals. One of these these doohickeys here. And like I said, please download that document and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You just take that ring terminal, take the plastic off, open it up and bend it to fit to where it hits the trace right where you can solder it. Hopefully you can see that one there, that one's soldered down. There, you just wanna, wanna have good contact there and that way the case of your TO3 package is gonna get to where it needs to go. Okay, I know that's a little confusing, but download that document, I'm telling you, and read it if you're doing this, because it's going to be your guide, and you'll know what I'm talking about. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put uh, these transistors in here and get the other heat sink mounted. And I'm using, like I said, I'm using the same hardware layout that they have in this package here, except I'm using uh, number six instead of M4 and M3. Okay, first one we're gonna do here is the 219. And use plenty of heat sink compound. Don't be shy. And of course you have your little mica insulator here. Goes over the pins. Just push that down a bit. That'll spread out more whenever I wrench it down. It's a little uneven, but, and then put more on this side of it. Let's try to get this side a little, a little better. And then drop it into the unit and be sure that you get it the pins on the right, the right way around. Just like that, and I'll go ahead and screw that in. Okay, looks like we've got good uh, squeeze out all around that unit. And then the bottom, let's take a look at that. Here's a view of the bottom for you. There's the ring terminal soldered in and everything. And you can see the Pins are sticking up right next to those pads. We're going to bend those pins over a little bit and solder them directly to those, those pads. And I know that one pad there doesn't look great, but it is, it is glued down. It's solid. Uh, I did the best I could. You, this thing was pretty damaged, but I think it'll be okay. So you can see the pins sticking up through here and I'm just going to put a slight bend in these so they touch the pads a little better. I'm just going to use a small pair of pliers here, needle nose. Just put a little, little bit of bend in those guys. And then push them over to meet the pads better. Try to make better solder contact. And of course, make sure that the pins are not shorting to the heat sink. Okay, let's see. We can solder these bad boys in here. That one didn't want to stick too well. Okay. So what I like to do is use a, a push stick and get in here and get that bonded well. Oh, 
Yeah, those aren't even soldered. Okay. So as you saw there, those pins really didn't want to solder. I hate when stuff like that happens. You're trying to make a YouTube video and then all of a sudden your damn pins on your component out of nowhere just <laughs> won't take solder. So what I wound up doing was uh, scraping them a little bit to clean whatever crud was on them out of there and also using a little flux, which you can see now I got them uh, soldered in there a bit better. They're making good contact. I think this pad on this side, it did, it pulled up a bit after all that nonsense. But I don't know, sometimes this is the way this sort of rework business goes. Um, you know, even though that is pulled up a bit, I mean, it's making contract, contact with this whole giant trace here. So it should be okay. So because of what happened last time installing that guy, on this uh, LM338 that I'm going to install over here. On this one, probably a little close to camera here, but I'm just going to take a, a straight edge here, a razor blade, and I'm just going to scrape these pins off. Really only need to do it at the top. That and a little bit of uh, flux will make sure that we get soldered adhere to it. Okay, I just showed you how we made this little ring terminal. And it'll go on just about like that. So you can see that um, we now have plenty of area there to uh, get solder into to solder that down. So I just need to put the uh, uh, bolt through here and get this screwed down like the other one you can see over here. It's going to be just like this. Uh, this one I trimmed the ends of it just because it had a little bit less of a trace to go to. So let me get that bolt and nut installed and then we'll solder that one down. Okay, I've got the ring terminal screwed on there. It's not uh, entirely screwed all the way down so I can adjust this a little bit. I'm just going to make sure it's all the way over here over the trace as much as I can get it. Or get that get it straight as I can. I'm actually just gonna push this down now, like bend it down towards the trace so it's actually touching the trace, and I'm just gonna solder it in right there. Okay, let's try to solder this guy on here. Just a little bit of flex on there. This little area will flow a lot of solder in there. There we go. Looks good. Okay, so we'll just bend these pins a little bit. Get a, a good curve on them. And go ahead and push them over like that. And I'll apply a little flux to help the solder stick to these pins and the pads. a decent amount of solder there use the push stick to heat it up and push it into that blob of solder just like that
And there you go. Okay, here's all the work completed on the PCB as far as the heat sink and the semiconductors are concerned. You can see I've got them all soldered directly to the PCB. We've got our little links over to the traces with the ring terminals. Got everything screwed in with the hardware. It's kind of cool looking with all the bolts on there and everything. But everything, of course, is isolated from the PCB because it has a nylon washers under it. Let's look at the top side. Here. Here goes the top side. It's going to be a little difficult to see. Exactly. Maybe I'll hold it like this. There you go. Here's all of our semiconductors installed, all bright and shiny. And right there. So next thing you do is move on to the big capacitors. Okay, here's our replacement capacitors. These are the Kemet 10,000 microfarads at 40 volts DC. That's the part number there, that ALP20A103DD040. That is the part number. And it has this weird pin arrangement, which I have no idea what that's called <laughs> or anything. These are straight from uh, Lithuania. Hopefully if you guys are doing this power supply refurbish, you don't have to go through such an extreme measure as to getting these all the way from Lithuania. <laughs> Hopefully you can find them in stock where you are. Um, here's a comparison to the one I took out. You can see they're almost identical in size, actually. And uh, there's those weird pinouts. It's the same pinout, even though, even though it looks a little different, the pins are actually in the same physical space. Let's go ahead and bring in the meter here. We zero out the the leads on it. Okay. And we were across one and five, if I remember right. Let's check the old cap. Looks like point oh seven. Let's check these new ones. I believe it's going to be here and here. 0.01. Here, I think. Yeah. Point oh two three. Point oh two, and this last guy was he reading? Point oh two. So a little bit better ESR than the originals that were in it. So these things are a bit of a tight squeeze getting the pins to fit. They, they are the correct um, size, but they're, they're probably just to the, the wider end of what's realistic. So just go easy putting them in. And there's really no way to put it in backwards. It's, it's only going to line up one way with those pins. And you can see they're all kind of lined up, except this one for some reason the uh, heat shrink uh, label on the outside is turned the other way, but that kind of sucks, but oh well. That's just uh, for looks. And yeah, just make sure it's seated. You can see there's little, there's like a little standoff 
uh, in pins in there. The pins are like actual pins, and they widen out into that standoff. And I'll try to flip this over and show you the the bottom of it. They'll stay in there by themselves. They're they're definitely tight enough. So yeah, that's all of them in. Just uh, like I said, go easy and be careful that you don't uh, push out any of the pads, especially these pads that are just used uh, to hold the uh, capacitor in there. Only two of these pads are hooked up, this one and that one. Uh, those other pads are, are just there for strength. And since they're not on any traces, they're easy to, to break off there. Let me go ahead and solder these guys in. All right, so let's get these guys soldered in there. I'm gonna use a little flux because these these pins look a little tarnished, so I just want to help them out a little bit. Okay, I did have a a pad here in the back. This one here. Uh, it had, it came up with the uh, pin as it was pushing through. But like I said, this pad isn't electrically connected to anything. So I just shoved it back down flush with the board and soldered it, uh, which means that the pin is not going to pull through anyways. That's all you really need to do on something like that because it's not, it's not connected to anything, so it doesn't matter. Okay, there she is, all rebuilt, all new caps, all new electrolytics all the way around, new semiconductors, new hardwares on the heat sink. Looks like she's going to be ready for another 30 years of use. So really the only thing left to do now is put the fuse holders uh, into the case. And once we get those in there, we can actually put the board in and reconnect it and then go for power up and see what happens. So here's the case and I've got all the fuse holders removed. There is a little bit of, of rust in some of these holes. So I'm just gonna use my trusty switch blade and then treat it with some Blistol. I'm just gonna scrape it out of there and and put some Blistol on it to treat it uh, so it won't rust up again. Well, hopefully that's helped clean it up a bit. And uh, if I haven't mentioned it before, which I believe I have, Blistol is really good at stopping the little bits of surface rust that you get on these kinds of equipment where it's exposed like that. You just knock it off the best you can and then the Blistol will pretty much treat it and then uh, stop it from spreading. Now, the fuse holders, these are the Schurter FEU fuse holders. Now to think about these, I've done some more research uh, since the last video on this subject. And it seems like uh, if you're in a country that's running 240 volts, these being rated at 10 amps are, are just barely enough to get the job done. Plus, Colin had mentioned in an email that these things go high resistance over time. And that's probably why in both of these supplies and others that I've seen pictures of online, 
you see one or two of these are, have been changed out for a, a more modern uh, fuse holder. And I think that the probably the best thing to actually put in here is going to be a fuse holder that's rated at 20 amps uh, for 240 volts. I'm in a 120 volt country, so theoretically these would have double the ampacity. They do appear to be made out of a bit of a different plastic, um, you know, so maybe this has changed over, you know, the last 30 years and this is a little bit more reliable. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put these guys in since I got them and I want it to look original. Unfortunately, I only bought three, uh, which I would have bought a fourth one to do the mains fuse. And I will get that changed afterwards because the plastic on the ones I pulled out, it's, it's getting super brittle. And uh, that needs to be changed. So I'm going to go ahead and get these guys in here. They just slot through. Then they have a, a nut that fits on. And I'm going to do them uh, sideways like this. That's kind of how they, they were originally mounted in there. So this nut just fits over like that. And then goes down and... tightens up on the thread and I'll use a C wrench on that to get that a little bit tighter and let me go ahead and get all those installed okay now that I've got these installed I'm gonna go ahead and drop the faceplate back down we're gonna need to do that to fit the circuit board in anyways plus it'll give us clearance to actually hook up the, the electrical connections to these we got the faceplate folded down the clearance for our PCB Get her up in here. Try to get her aligned on those standoffs. There. All right. Okay. So I'll get the screws in there, reattach all the wires that I can reattach now, and then we'll. Uh, attach the new fuse holder wires to it and put the faceplate back on. Okay, I've got the board screwed back in. We've got all the connections to the PCB remade. And now we have to make connections between our new front panel fuse holders and our PCB. And what I did, I made up new connections for that. You can see them right here. These, of course, are just crimp on terminals. The one thing you have to watch out for is that on the FEU fuse holders these are three sixteenths right here and on the pcb it's a quarter um, i don't know if they make these with a quarter i thought i was actually ordering one quarter when i ordered these but they're not they're three sixteenths so you need to make up and when you make these up you're gonna have to make them up with the small one that's a quarter there here let me show them like this one of those is a quarter and one's a three sixteenth. So you need them obviously on opposite side, three sixteenth on that side, quarter on that side. And it's a two and a half inch jumper that comes off this back lead and goes to the rear terminal. And then the three inch jumper here comes off the side lead and goes to the front terminal. So I'm going to go ahead and hook one of those up so here's the short lead 
to three sixteenths. So I'm just gonna hopefully get that on there, breaking anything. <laughs> and I'm not sure I can actually get these on there. I'm gonna go ahead and hook hook this one in. Again, hopefully without breaking anything. Okay, I'm gonna actually get all of these on here first because there's not really enough lead to get it over to uh, to get it connected. I'm gonna have to to get them on here, then shut the front on it to actually get them connected. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these other ones on, then then do that. Okay, I've got the front panel reinstalled. I put in new black oxide socket head cap screws. I've coaxed the LEDs back through the front. These were a little uh, bent around when I was working on the board. Hopefully they're still good. So now all we need to do is uh, reattach the wires to the fuse holder. Okay, here's the fuse holders installed. I don't know if you guys noticed in the last shot, but I had a couple of these wire colors mixed up actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are a little, little tight. I wish I'd have made them a little longer. I think maybe you should make them more like uh, two and three quarters and I don't know three and a quarter or something. I mean mine two and a half and three so maybe two and three quarters and three and a quarter would be a, a little bit better but I actually went ahead and loosened up the sockets and these didn't move. So the wires are quite content to just stay like that. They're bent in that shape now. But yeah I just sort of released some stress off of them and retighten them up and now they seem they seem fine, they seem ready to go. And this uh, wire, by the way, is 14 gauge wire. That's what came out of there. I just put uh, the same stuff back in, or same gauge anyways. So we've got that done. I need to put some fuses in. And you know, I, I think that's it. I think just pop it in some fuses and then uh, we can smoke test this baby, put it on a Variac and see if it explodes or not. Okay, we're ready for a smoke test on this thing. I've installed fuses. I have a, a five amp slow blow in the mains. I've got uh, 10 amp uh, regular quick blow fuses in the plus and minus rails. And the same thing, uh, except a one amp fuse in the uh, phantom power rail. Uh, as far as the setup here, this meter back here is gonna read the voltage coming off the Variac as I bring it up. Uh, the unit itself is plugged into the Variac and the dim bulb tester over there. So we just make sure that we limit the current if something's wrong on this. And then individually, I'm going to be probing the outputs when it comes up. And you'll be able to see that on the, the blue meter. Uh, so everything is switched on. We should be ready to go. I'm just going to turn on the Variac first. Okay. And I'm going to start to bring the Variac up. And again, you can watch it here on this meter to see what voltage. And also keep an eye on the light bulb back there to make sure it doesn't light up. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and come on up. It's about 20 volts, everything seems normal. Let that settle out a little bit there. That's 40 volts. And it looks like the LEDs on the front panel are starting to glow. I don't see anything weird happening, which is good. So I'm going to come on up. It's about halfway. All of the LEDs on the front panel are glowing. Everything looks okay so far. 
I don't expect the large cap to explode or anything because you can't really put those in backwards, thank God. <laughs> It's going up about 80 volts and just check and see if we get anything coming out of our you know what I need to be gotta set my meter right Let's see what we get here nearly 40 on phantom here's your minus 18 and you're plus 18 and they're basically already there we go ahead and bring this on up to full line voltage everything's looking real good There's 120. So let's check the Phantom rail. 48 volts. I think this is the minus 18 and a plus 18 rail. Yep. That all looks good. All right, sweet. All of our LEDs are glowing in the front panel. The mains indicator is lit up. Nothing feels too hot. I would say that was a success. I think we're looking pretty good. Awesome. Well, there it is, a fully rebuilt TAC 750 power supply. Go ahead and flip her on. You can see she comes right up, all of our LEDs. By the way, the main switch does go down in the UK, not up. So that's perfectly normal. We've got all of our fuse holders back in here, just like they were factory original. And this thing's ready to go into the rack and uh, go for a test to see if anything weird happens. I think right before I do that though, I'm gonna pull the other power supply out of the rack and uh, we'll take a quick look at it and see how it compares to this one as far as the components and everything. Okay, here's the current power supply that I've been running for a little over a year now and pulled it out, took the top off and of course it has a whole assortment of weird hardware just like the one I just rebuilt did and you can see here we have one of these these fuse holders are changed this seems to be a little bit different version of the PCB let me let me swing you over there okay hopefully you can see that PCB better this basically has the same this is the same uh, layout is the one we just rebuilt i'm gonna gather that this one I, I really don't know i think this may be newer i want to say uh, the differences i can see right off are there are these sockets for the attachment to points to the pcb there's some, some down here and there's one back here in this corner these red sockets and again this one too on the one we just rebuilt of course those connections were directly to the PCB this is um, uh, these diodes have a part number on them on in here it's 261-659 so it might help in sourcing those it has the same exact bulk caps that one looks a little funky these are the uh, 10,000 at 40 volts and as far as the uh, transistors in it we have the MJ 2955, which was a spec originally on the schematic. Uh, that's the one that had been changed and the one we just rebuilt. 
This has the 317 in it. Looks like a national. And this has uh, two LM338K steels. Also national semiconductor. And it's still, yeah, it has the sockets, the TO3 sockets in it still, except these are screwed down tight. So it hasn't been uh, modified at all. This looming is kind of pulling away from their, its mounts here. It's very, it's very dirty inside. And it does right here have a serial number of 500. Let me go look at the other one real fast and see what serial number it is. Maybe that'll tell us the date. Okay, I just looked at the other chassis that we just rebuilt and the serial number on it is 677. Uh, I don't know if the serial numbers on these went in series or not, but if you look at the the transistors that we took out of the other one, they have a little bit newer date codes. There's 85 and 86. This one has some eight, an 83 and some 85. So actually, I think this is the older version. I, it, I thought it was probably newer. Just things look a little better in it. It's dusty as hell, but things generally look a little a little better. I guess that other one just went through a lot of heck. So this one appears to be an earlier uh, model, probably from 85, whereas the other one was some uh, 86, it looks like, which would be the same year as my console. So, all right, let's uh, go ahead and put that sucker in the rack and get it hooked up and and run the console on it. Okay, here's the rack underneath my console that I keep my console power supply in. This is an Ikea Rast rack. I would tell you to go watch my Rast rack video, but unfortunately, Ikea decided to discontinue these and you can't buy them anymore. That's no fun. So anyways, I, of course, have a, an IEC connector and here's the uh, power supply connector. This is the original cable, too. I need to Probably change that connector at some point. Cable seems to be good, but the connector's getting a bit old. So, apply some power. Get up in there a little closer. Get this connector connected. There it is. Screw it in. Okay, I figure it's better if um, you guys watch the power supply. I want to turn it on and I'll watch the console and make sure nothing funky happens. So let's go ahead and switch it on. Let's hope for the best. All right. Got our mains light and our three LEDs. The console looks to be functioning okay. So let me set up and run some audio through the console. So you know what let's do? You remember the task cam from the last videos that I fixed? Let's go ahead and let's use that as our audio source. So, uh, power up there you go So the only thing you're really going to see is the the master LEDs because I'm running that tape as in tape two. Um, but yeah, the console's functioning, so you can see the LEDs. So seems to be good. I think really all I can do now is just uh, 
just run it burn it in and test it all right